So, we talked a little bit uh, beforehand, and, and you mentioned that this talk might be slightly different than the normal talks that you've done lately um, because of this focus on architecture as well as politics and morality. So I wanted to start out um, off the bat uh, saying, let's talk about what it was like when you were still with Booz Allen, when you were still working as a contractor for the NSA. Um, before you blew the whistle on government surveillance, you had to collect all the evidence. Um, what about the actual architecture of the systems that you were using in your job uh, made that job, that collection of information, easy? What made it possible for an outside contractor such as yourself to obtain so much secret information? Well, I, I think the first thing to understand here is actually that it, that it wasn't easy. Uh, and this is actually a little bit chilling. Uh, when we look at the statements of uh, Congress, for example, in response to what happened in, in June of 2013, uh, when I provided information, uh, evidence uh, about serious crimes by the United States government against its own people and people around the world, uh, they said, many of them, including the authors of the laws uh, that the intelligence community, our spies, were saying they were acting under, uh, the people who wrote these laws said they had no idea that the laws were being applied this way. They said they had no idea that these programs existed. Uh, the, the companies uh, that were involved in these kind of activities, uh, some of the largest names on the internet, right? Uh, when they were being uh, sort of outed on the front page of the newspapers, they said they had no idea that they were part of these programs. Uh, in fact, initially they denied that there was any cooperation, and only later did they, they, they admit that this was the case. So the, the key point that I'm making here is that the government was carving silos uh, out within uh, sort of the American space of government into which not only the public had no visibility, but the vast majority even of the government itself had no visibility. And so then there was a question of uh, how could this imbalance of power between the governing and the governed uh, be corrected? How could this be made more equal? How could our democracy be strengthened? And I would argue this is through equal access of information or at least more equal access of information. Uh, and this was intentionally designed into the system to be impossible. Uh, at the NSA, for example, at the CIA, for example, where I also worked, uh, every time you access a document, right, a, a record would be made that would say your name, this person at this time accessed this document. Uh, so if something went missing, uh, they could try to find it. But no system is perfect. Uh, and I had the rare good fortune of working both at the CIA and the NSA meaning I had seen both our human intelligence collection capabilities and our electronic uh, intelligence collection capabilities. I knew how we spied on others, and I knew how we spied on ourselves. Uh, and what that meant was I was one of the rare people with both the knowledge of what was going on and where it was going wrong, and the ability to gather this information and, and provide it to journalists. But this begs the question then, all right, you're uh, me or, or someone like me, you have discovered that your government is up to no good. They're breaking the law. They're violating the rights of the public. Uh, and you've gotten the proof. Let's presume you, you have the evidence. How do you get it to journalists without being caught? Right. When the story is about how the internet is being monitored pervasively. Yep. Uh, you can't use your Gmail account when that is op an open door for government. Google Hangouts, what we're using right now, you know. <laughs> exactly. Uh, they get a copy of, of uh, sort of any call that they want like this. Uh, so just a, a quick sort of uh, illustration for those in the audience who are a little bit more technical. Uh, you've got journalists on one side of the internet uh, who you don't know. You have to identify them. You have to find uh, methods of contact for them. Uh, then there's you on the other side uh, who has the information that they need to tell the public what's going on. And then you have this hostile path to them through the internet that is monitored, that is, is exploited. 
And some of these journalists on the other side don't know how to use uh, secure communications. At, at the time, yeah. uh, <laughs> there is no uh, end-to-end encryption uh, that is commonplace, right? Not everyone is using Signal Messenger. Yep. Uh, WhatsApp isn't using the Signal Protocol. It's amazing watching you explain to Glenn Greenwald how to set up uh, GPG. <laughs> like, <laughs> right, right. But the beautiful thing is uh, Bitcoin still exists, right? Uh, the knowledge, the capabilities were there. Uh, but just like the knowledge of mass surveillance uh, was still there, it was unequally, unevenly applied. Uh, what we've been doing in these past five years is raising the average level of education. Uh, we're expanding the communities that have these capabilities to go, all right, I'm on an island uh, in Hawaii, different side of the world. I have to find a way to get this across the Internet. OK, you encrypt your communications, right? But then uh, when the government is investigating these journalists who they know are writing these stories, they're going to simply pull their internet histories and go, I want to see every connection that's made to this person. I want to see every email uh, that's been written to this person for the last 30 days, six months, 90 days, 180 days, whatever. Uh, and I want to see every IP address that sent that. They want to just follow the chain back, go see which server sent that, who connected to that server. And eventually you get a list of IP addresses. If you're doing this from home, uh, that could lead back to you. If you're doing this from a coffee shop, does the coffee shop have cameras in it? Did you make a, a credit card purchase at that? Can the government simply cross-reference a list of its employees at the local facility with the list of uh, people who made credit card purchases at that cafe at that day that that email was sent to that journalist? Uh, these were the kind of things that I was thinking about. I used things like the Tor project uh, to route my communications. I did not use my home uh, access. I did not use uh, public cafe access. In fact, I constructed probably the uh, largest non-public map of wireless access points in Hawaii uh, by going war driving around in my car and looking for ones that weren't locked down, oh. uh, that were in places that were not near my home, so like and George, using theirs. Like George Costanza uh, with bathrooms. They were, they were very helpful. You know all the Wi-Fi hotspots in Hawaii. That's interesting. Um, but briefly, the, the yeah. quick point here is that every system uh, will have methods of control built into it, where whoever, if we have a central authority for the Internet, be they government, be they Google, be they Facebook, uh, will try to limit what you can do. They will try to instruct you as to how you can use the system. And the only way to change that, the only way to revolutionize that is to look for the spaces that they do not understand as well as those who live there. If you have a better understanding of the network than your adversary, you can change that network because you can operate it on it uh, in ways that they cannot control. Yeah. So uh, here's a question. Um, you use Tor. Do you like using Tor? Is it a good user experience? I <laughs> I love Tor. For the average person, they would uh, they would say it's too slow, uh, but I would say it has gotten faster every year for you know the the last ten. Do you think there are enough um, relay nodes in the network to make it um, robustly private and secure? Uh, I think it's a mistake to count on uh, any kind of mixed net uh, for perfect privacy. Yeah. The better question is, does it provide more robust privacy than your home connection uh, through your ISP? Does it provide more robust protection than a VPN, mm -hmm. uh, which is a single point of failure, right? If uh, a government goes to that VPN provider and sort of holds them by the ankles and, and shakes them upside down until records fall out of their pockets, uh, will yours be in that? Will that lead back to you? Uh, if it is a volunteer-run network uh, where there are no payment records, such as Tor, uh, you have a larger layer of protection. You've got a bigger buffer. Mm -hmm. uh, but to rely on any single system uh, to make you invisible on the Internet is to mis make a mistake. You have to understand how the system works. And most critically, you have to always be thinking about what happens when this layer of protection fails, where are you then exposed? And that way you can shim in new layers, redundant layers of protection, so that if one fails, you have defense in depth. 
Yeah, I, I bring it up in part because we, um, we had folks from the ORCID project here today explaining what they're trying to build, which may interest you if you're not familiar with it already. It's a decentralized marketplace for VM, VPN providers that also includes some level of onion routing or, or uh, multi-hop anonymization. And the idea is, uh, with Tor, we rely on the goodwill of a bunch of volunteers to run nodes, and we hope that there are enough of them that it makes it impossible to fully identify both the origin and destination of the, the communication. Why not find a way to create an open market um, for paying for these services? The problem being that you have a centralized choke point in the form of a payment processor, and that could defeat the system. I'm curious if that idea is uh, provocative to you, interesting. They're not the only ones working on that project. There are a few. Uh, it's pretty exciting stuff. Yeah, in, in general, we always want to be, what, what they're doing there is they're looking at uh, the known weaknesses in, in the Tor project, right? Which is uh, briefly, uh, I'm sure they explained this, but there's three hops in any Tor circuit. Uh, sort of an entry node, a, a relay node, and, and an exit node. The exit node can see the requests for a user, but they don't know which user sent it. Uh, the entry node knows who is sending requests, but they don't know what the requests are for. But if you get uh, sort of three bad nodes, uh, the odds of this are pretty low, but uh, if they can get that whole chain and it's a single person, a single adversary cooperating, they can see the whole network, right, or, or the whole circuit that you have until it changes. Uh, and this, of course, is uh, something that we should be planning for. What is the next best step? I don't know enough about this project to say that's the case, but sure. the idea is the more robust we make any network, the more layers of decentralization that we put in, the more layers of trustless cooperation uh, that we put in, the safer we all are. And I imagine part of the reason um, that you would want to use Tor or VPNs, but preferably Tor, would be your day-to-day -day experiences on the internet are use are primarily communications IP address to IP address. And that's all a, a, a record of your activities, correct? And what can you tell us about the architecture of you know, the internet when it comes to IP addresses, when it comes to how computers connect to each other, that to you, your mind is, uh, is one of these vulnerabilities, one of these centralized repositories that makes it easy for government to collect information from us, that makes it easy, um, it makes it hard to be private or hard to be able to feel like you can speak sure. without your expression chilled? Okay, so imagine that uh, someone wants to know what you're doing. Um, it could be a government, doesn't have to be. Uh, could be a, a, a jealous ex, uh, could be a company, could be you know a litigant. Uh, they decide to hire someone to follow you around all day. Uh, there are limits on what they can see uh, about you. They can sit outside your house all day long. Uh, they don't see what happens inside your home, but they know when you leave. They can follow your car, get your plate number, know where you go. Uh, now we've got uh, sort of license plate recognition cameras all over the place, so this makes it even easier. They see you stop at a restaurant. They see who you meet with, take a photograph of them but they don't sit directly behind you in the cafe where they can hear everything you're saying uh, because you might be suspicious who this person is that's following you around everywhere you go. Uh, but they know where you were, when you were there, who you met with, how long you met with them, uh, where that person went afterwards if they choose to follow that person, so on and so forth. This is what we would call generally metadata. Mm -hmm. Even if you encrypt uh, your activities online, this same information is still available for everyone, everywhere, no matter what they're doing, unless they're taking extraordinary care uh, to hide the, the methods of their communication. Because uh, when you think about encryption and the internet and everything at large, metadata, the metadata problem is the signaling problem. Everywhere a communication is occurring, uh, there is a signal that is being broadcast on the IP layer, and there is a destination for that uh, sort of communication. So as long as you can see that addressing information, the source of it and the destination of it, the source of it and the destination of it, you can create a network of human relationships. You can create perfect records of private lives. Uh, 
particularly when you start gaining access to what those private eyes could not get. Now you have Amazon Alexa sitting on your shelf. They could hear what's happening inside your apartment. We are carrying around and paying uh, people to put cameras in our pockets, uh, microphones in our pockets that are tracking our movements as we move from a uh, cellular network cell site uh, as we move across town. Uh, these things happen 2G, 3G, 4G, LTE. It doesn't matter what network. They all function the same way. Ultimately, they have a perfect record of your activities. And what this means uh, is that your digital communications are fundamentally qualitatively different than the ones that you have face to face, because the ones that you have face to face are in a, at least some way ephemeral. They're forgotten. You speak your words into the air, the sound attenuates as it travels out, and then it is gone, lost to history, but for those who were there to hear it. Right. When it crosses the internet, these are entering databases, uh, both by commercial providers like Facebook, who are trying to exploit them for commercial value, mm -hmm. uh, and for governments who are trying to exploit them for intelligence value, who want to know what their publics are doing, who want to know what foreign groups are doing. Uh, and this, this is what we need to take care to guard against. Yeah. So, so you suggested that there's a little bit of a selling ourselves down the river with respect to privacy. You know, people are putting Alexas in their home. We pay to have cameras in our pocket. And I, I think for the average person, the non-technical person, this doesn't seem like a bargain about privacy. Um, it seems like just better services. So it's rather like if you put the frog into boiling water, it jumps out. If you put the frog in cold water, it and gradually heat it up, it cooks itself. You know, we, we didn't think we were selling our privacy, we thought we were just getting more friends on Facebook. A lot of what people at this conference are excited about is the idea that we could have user-friendly and engaging apps, games, services. Bitcoin being an early version, something like a decentralized PayPal, um, but other things being maybe more whimsical or fun, like CryptoKitties. Uh, are you familiar with CryptoKitties, Ed? Yeah. <laughs> you own a bunch of crypto kitties, don't you? <laughs> Has anyone sent him I a crypto kitty? I absolutely do not. <laughs> but, but I know people who do. Yeah. And, and, and so the idea here is maybe um, if, if we can deliver services that, that are uh, more engaging and more important to people, things like money, not just speech, things like collectibles that they get affinities over, not just uh, visiting a website through Tor. Maybe that's one motivation to get people to actually start using systems that would otherwise be more difficult than their centralized counterparties. So like, it's hard to use Tor. Um, the other approach is you got to make the user interface better. Signal is a much better user interface than uh, G GPG. And, and are, are they of equal security? It's hard to know, but a lot more people are using Signal now. What do you think, what would you want to tell this developer community who really wants to build decentralized apps about the, the, the pitfalls of that approach or what excites you about that approach? Do you think we can remove the Amazons of the world slowly from the equation or the Googles of the world slowly from the equation by turning them into protocols like Bitcoin or Ethereum? Yeah, I mean, this is this is the dream that we're talking about. Uh, an open society uh, is dependent upon the concept of privacy, right? Uh, people say, you know, if, if you don't have anything to hide, why do you care? Um, but arguing that you don't care about privacy because you have nothing to hide is like saying that you don't care about freedom of speech because you have nothing to say. Uh, it, it misses the point. Privacy isn't about something to hide. Privacy is about something to protect. And that thing is an open society, a free society that understands the value of the individual and that understands that the value of those individuals is the fact that they, we are all different, that we are irreplaceable. It, it is our minority opinions uh, from which progress derives. If everybody thought the same thing, if everybody believed the same thing, if we were all on the same page, uh, we wouldn't have that wonderful her heresy against the orthodoxy of a new idea. And what this, this ultimately means in the context of protocols and commerce and, and decentralization is the problem of the internet today 
is that all of our transactions are uh, irrevocably tied uh, by the standard method of operation to our identity. Uh, you pay for internet service in your true name. Uh, it is registered to your home address, right? Uh, it is using your personal payment information. So everything that occurs on the internet connection can be traced back to you. It's not just the books that you buy on Amazon.com that Jeff Bezos has a you know, permanent record of since sitting in some database somewhere. Uh, it's who can see that you're connecting to Amazon.com in the first place. That would be your internet service provider. It would be anyone who has access to that line. Uh, encryption provides us a better level of protection. But fundamentally, so long as our transactions on the internet are connected to our identities, they are not private. Yeah. What we need to do is change internet transactions from being the equivalent of going to uh, a gas station and buying a bottle of water with a credit card uh, to being able to buy a, a bottle of water with cash anywhere, right? Where there is no transaction. And just like our words, our interests can be as ephemeral in this new modern society as they have been in every generation past. Yeah. People need a right to be forgotten, to feel secure in their ideas. Well, and it's interesting, if, if you're paying with cash too, instead of a credit card, it can be a vending machine instead of a gas station. It can be something quite Absolutely. robotic. Absolutely, you don't need a person. Right, because these lumpy gas stations that exist on the internet, <laughs> they're ISPs, as you were saying, they're uh, DNS providers, domain, domain name systems, uh, the thing that makes Google.com match up with Google server addresses. They're certificate authorities for saying, yes, this is the real Google.com, not um, an impersonator trying to collect your personal information, a sock puppet, if you will. Another project in this space is the idea that we can take those centralized repositories, which are just ledgers. DNS is just a ledger. You know, a certificate authority is just a ledger, and turn them into things like the Bitcoin ledger. I think that's, that's one of the key visions behind the, the folks that I've talked to at Blockstack. That's a key vision behind a lot of the uh, architecture that people are building in this room. Um, do you think that, do you think there's, this is a good approach? Do you think this is an approach that might have more impact um, in the next 20 years to protect our privacy than taking an alternative approach? And the alternative approach is the systems we're going to assume aren't going to change much. They're going to continue to be leaky and have these centralized intermediaries. But maybe we can get back involved in the democratic process as young people who are excited about technology and know about it and push governments to lay off of it, uh, to use democracy and government and the Constitution to get our privacy back. Is that more fruitful, less fruitful than rebuilding the architecture? They're both hard problems. I just. <laughs> Thought I'd get you. Yeah, I mean, this is a great question. It's, you know, what's going to save us? Are we going to improve our technology or are we going to uh, rescue our democracy? Uh, and these are troubled times for democracy around the world. It, it's, it's not hard to see in country after country, ones that have traditionally been seen as sort of the, the champions of the free liberal world order. Uh, now struggling very hard against some quite dark forces uh, internal as often as not. And the question becomes, if it's happening in, in many different countries that have many different systems, uh, what is it that's really changed and, and how do we correct it? Uh, I'm not a politician, so I don't want to prescribe solutions there. Uh, but I, I think the first thing to understand is that we are the only ones who are going to solve this. Uh, we cannot wait for someone else to fix this for us. This is the, the sort of uh, paralysis that I faced when I was at NSA uh, and saw that my government was violating the rights of everyone uh, in my home and around the world and hoping someone else would do something about this. I, I saw Barack Obama get elected uh, earlier on and he campaigned on a platform of ending warrantless wiretapping, right? He said, that's not who we are. Uh, we're not gonna do this anymore. Uh, and in fact, he expanded the system rather than ending it. Uh, he expanded uh, sort of drone strikes, uh, unlawful killings, uh, so, so many other programs. It's not about Obama, right? 
It's about the idea that when we have politicians who are campaigning on platforms of reform, who are credible, who we have reason to believe in, and yet even they make the system worse, maybe we have to stop looking at the status quo. Now, technology is not going to solve all of our problems. But if we have looked at the law for you know, uh, the history of civilization, as the guarantor, the sole guarantor of rights in society. And we see that the law uh, is beginning to become brittle as that guarantor of rights. Can we find new means of enforcing our rights, our laws, our values through technology, through protocols to enshrine our values in a system that is not going to fall to the same typical uh, predictable corruptions of, of human behavior, right? We all have weaknesses. We all make mistakes. We all come under pressure. Uh, but machines do not in the same way. Now, yes, we have bugs and yes, we will screw things up. Uh, but can we build a brick upon which someone else can lay another brick, which will eventually create a foundation for a better and freer world in which no one is worse off, right? But we are all better off. Let us not make a zero sum society. Let's make a cooperative progressive society by thinking about the core values, the core capabilities that we need. We need to be able to trade permissionlessly and privately. We need to be able to communicate without fear, without interdiction, if we're not doing something wrong. This doesn't mean there needs to be no surveillance whatsoever, right? Government can still have a job to do uh, until we move to a world that has matured uh, and is beyond government, right? But today we don't know what that world looks like. What we do know are what the problems today are. And these are having a serious impact. It's quite easy to be in Germany, to be in the United States, and think, yes, the government is breaking the law. Yes, they're spying on us, but it's really no big deal. My neighbors aren't being marched off to camps. And for now, that's true. But in other places, this is not the case. Think about Turkey. Think about Russia. Think about China. Uh, and if we are going to make a better world, a freer world, a more private world, we have to protect the rights of everyone. If it is selective and any authority is trusted to be able to pick and peel away these rights ad hoc, uh, whether they be a government, a corporation, or anyone else, inevitably they will. And they will not always fairly, and in fact, one could say more often than not, they can be, uh, based on history, sure uh, to pick preferentially to violate the rights of those who are their adversaries, regardless of whether what they're doing is wrong, uh, it becomes a question of whether what they're doing or not is approved. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting that you suggested, and I, I don't think it's, I think I disagree, uh, but I see your point that law has historically been the only guarantor of rights, although I think that does almost approach on a kind of legalism. I think, um, to use a word that, you, that you've used frequently, this idea that we should just be subservient to the written word of law and, and not have, you know, other opinions, as of course you do. Um, but I think it's true that law and the physical reality that we find ourselves in, the architecture that we find ourselves in, uh, the nature of how difficult it is to do something, are working together in most cases. So when a police officer searches your house, it's hard. They have to have somebody in your location get through your door, go through your things, and it also sends a big signal to everyone else in the world that this is happening. It doesn't happen surreptitiously. You know, if it's a small community, oh, they knocked down Peter's door the other day. Um, technology, I think, has made it easier to do top-down law. So the kind of law that says, we're going to declare certain things permissible and impermissible, we're going to organize society through regulatory control. We're going to have a Securities Exchange Commission that protects investors by top-down dictates. We're going to have uh, a, an anti-money laundering authority that's going to stop the illicit flows of funds from top-down dictates as to where you can and cannot send money, what countries you can send money to and you can't. Technology's made that easier, while it's made it harder to have the kind of private law that also protected our rights, the rights of property, 
the rights of contract, the rights to say, I'm sorry, you can't come on my property, police officer. You don't have a warrant. The technology with respect to digital property made it impossible to know whether the police officer came onto your property or not. <laughs> and I think, so we had Nick Zabo here earlier. Um, Nick Zabo wrote all about smart contracts. How can we make that private law, that person-to-person -person law that, of contracts work in the digital world where normally agreements are hard to enforce because people are all anonymous or people are pseudonymous or things like that? How can we make property law work in the digital world. He developed the BitGold protocol, a precursor to Bitcoin. And Bitcoin's a great example of property law working in the digital world. So do you think accepting this thesis that maybe we're just now catching up with matching technology with private law, the way technology was matched with top-down administrative law, are you optimistic? Do you, do you think this plan could work? That we could actually, um, may, so maybe it's not a trade-off between getting rid of surveillance, uh, illicit surveillance or impermissible surveillance through technology versus politics. It's that we need, through law, we need technology to work with the right types of laws. We need technology that backs up private law, the law of citizens when they bump into each other and they use the courts to dispute. <laughs> Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I think there's a little bit of a. Uh, it, it, it's not a contention, but our our understanding of what the argument means here that is uh, the distance between us. Uh, I'm not saying we get rid of law, right? Uh, because as you uh, sort of imply, technology code is a different kind of law. Uh, we're setting rules at a different layer, right? Uh, law is simply code that's written in in black ink on a page. Uh, that has no uh, sort of motivating force of its own. It can't jump off the page and defend your rights. Uh, it's not going to open a door for you. It's not going to keep a bank uh, from admitting you as a customer or tell a bank what to do. But people's belief in that piece of paper will. Uh, people's choice to follow that uh, is, is what motivates and creates these systems of rules. What we are doing is we're creating systems in this private law context that you're speaking about, so basically contract law uh, in, in technology that is useful uh, because we're not relying on that distinction, that distance uh, between the letters on the page and the people who carry out the ads. Uh, we have the machine and its instructions, and so long as it is well instructed, uh, it has no choice but to execute. Uh, those instructions. And can this create basically a layer uh, that creates a kind of trustless trust, which <laughs> seems like a, uh, uh, an impossibility, but this is what we're reaching at. Uh, we have in, in the universe, the only things that we can really count on are, are physical universal laws. The apple is going to fall off the tree. It's going to hit the ground because gravity is always there. Uh, can we make contracts that function on the same principle? Yep. It cannot be abrogated with the kind of casual ease that we've been talking about in these government contexts, these corporate contexts, in these person-to-person -person sort of verbal uh, contexts before. Can we make trust more reliable by creating it in a new kind of way? Uh, that's fundamentally what this question is about. It's not about should we have law or should we have technology? Uh, of course, we can and should have both, but how do we make them work uh, to their optimal advantage uh, for the betterment of all people? And I think this is what decentralization, uh, the, the sort of uh, relentless pursuit for decentralization is all about. We talk about it in different ways. We talk about it in commercial contexts because whether we like it or not, uh, capitalism is what's driving a lot of our progress forward. Uh, because it incentivizes the creation of these new experimental systems. But if we get them, right, the people in this room right now thinking about their markets, thinking about their customers, thinking about what they can do, fundamentally we are talking about new human capabilities for allowing people to interact safely and reliably 10 times out of 10. And if they achieve that, that's what changes the world. Yeah. So... If there's one big thing that your um, revelations have shown us is that technology changes the natures of our freedoms and rights, it nibbles away at them, 
uh, thus far. Uh, primarily, it diminishes them somewhat insidiously. Um, have you thought about this topic in relation to money and the financial system rather than communications, uh, rather than the question of the intermediary being Google with respect to your emails, it's Bank of America or Credit Suisse with respect to your bank accounts, or PayPal or Venmo to pick, tech, to pick on tech companies instead. Um, <laughs> so, for example, we used to transact with cash all the time in America. I'm fairly new to Germany, and I'm actually quite excited to see that a lot of people still transact with cash here. People don't use cash in America. They use credit cards. And that means that every transaction you make leaves a record. Um, are these issues analogous with the problem of intermediaries collecting too much metadata or too much information about our communications? Or is money somehow different and not worthy of the same privacy or free speech type protections? I mean, trade is communication. Um, when we are talking about uh, communication and trying to make this distinct from money, I think we're missing what it really is to be human and what it is to sort of engage with someone else. When you're communicating with someone, that is an exchange of values. Uh, it's an exchange of ideas, right? And it's an engagement, a recognition that this person is worthy of your time, of your attention. Uh, money is simply a different layer of the same exchange. It is a different quality that is being communicated. You're passing your time uh, in a unit of accounting kind of way, uh, rather than that time being used to convey your, your uh, sort of a symbolic expression verbally uh, of, of a, a method of context. Sorry, I wasn't really expecting to have to go to this level of abstraction today. Uh, but the idea here is, is look, yes, uh, private trade is the basis of all human cooperation. Um, you know, the counter to when that. we go down, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, the counter to that would be, um, we talk about rights, especially in the U.S. with the Constitution, but also um, internationally, we talk about rights as trumps, and unfortunately it's hard to use that term now without invoking the Donald, but we talk about rights as trumps that are more important than any rational calculation between whether people will be better off or worse off. We're not supposed to calculate. It's supposed to be something that's just a right. It's not, a, not something that's subject to trade-offs. And free speech gets a lot of that protection, generally, in the US. We say a communication shouldn't be censored when it's in transit. You shouldn't have authorities able to interject and stop someone from speaking because the answer to, you know, to, to, to bad speech is more speech. We need, you know, if someone has a terrible idea, we need to have more people speaking to outweigh that idea. We don't try and stop the idea. Now, with money and the idea that we could, you know, not have a, a mechanism to step in and stop money as it flows from one person to another, um, as it's flowing, no prior restraint on money, would, would fit into that right if money was like speech, if we should just have a right to do it without... Uh, prior restraint. You can police the activities afterwards, but you shouldn't be able to interject and stop the money as it flows. But the counter-argument to that, I think, is if you can't stop the flow of funds, like a million dollars, through the internet, isn't that riskier than not being able to stop a couple of paragraphs of propaganda? Uh, especially if at the other well, end of about... that transaction is a terrorist, or at the other end of that transaction is someone who's laundering money. Every human capability, not just technology, will be abused. Uh, this has been the case since before we knew to pick up a rock and club someone on the head. Uh, we used our fists, right? Um, when you talk about speech as being uh, sort of qualitatively different in the zone of rights, uh, that's a very American idea, right? Uh, in the United States, we do have stronger protections, but in Europe, there have long been prior restraints on speech. Uh, Germany has uh, regulations on this when you talk about certain types of extremism. Uh, we have seen even in the United States, uh, corporations particularly falling prey uh, to new kind of uh, restraints on this. Uh, in the context of terrorism, as you mentioned, uh, your concern was about money being sent to ISIS being different than uh, sort of ISIS speech. But indeed, we saw ISIS use of Twitter and Facebook and things like that 
uh, raising precisely these things. The question is not, uh, do you have a right to do something if that right can in any context, any edge case possibly be abused? And if it can be, then it is not a right, then we cannot do this. I think there is a presumption there uh, that we do not have a right to engage in private trade, that no monetary transaction can occur without the permission and regulation of the state. Uh, you know, we can think of this as the little girl uh, selling lemonade on the street outside of her house. Uh, does this fall uh, within the purview of government regulation? Of course, the government would say yes. Uh, the law strictly would say yes. Uh, but practically, pragmatically, realistically, humanistically, uh, should that be the case? Uh, should that be different than uh, having a conversation? I'm not sure that it does. Our laws are structured this way because the people who wrote them had to create space for government, and they found that the best means of delineating where the boundaries of government should lay were money, because money could be easily tracked, money could be recorded, it was already being accounted for, and this created, uh, shall we say, the first concrete database uh, before computation and data storage was a, a sort of modern uh, device, and it made it easily regulatable. But there is a larger question here, is ease of regulation equivalent uh, to the value or the strength of rights. Right. And I'm not sure that's the case. Right. You know, it's interesting. Or should be, right? Yeah. So moving on from censorship resistance, which is sort of a feature that Bitcoin has, to privacy, which is a feature that some other cryptocurrencies have developed. Um, with respect to the Fourth Amendment in the U.S. and our right against illegal search and seizure, um, right against warrantless search and seizure, uh, our financial privacy kind of went out the window in the U.S. actually faster than it, than it went out the window in Europe. And that was um, in large part because of a Supreme Court case called California Bankers versus Schultz, um, where our Fourth Amendment right to not have information taken without warrant was uh, backdoored, if you will, through the creation of a, a doctrine called the third party doctrine. Uh, the third party doctrine goes like this. If you've already handed your private information to an intermediary, like a bank or like Google, you've lost your reasonable expectation that that information should be free of warrantless search. And long before we got into this conversation about uh, internet surveillance and intermediaries and whether it's constitutional for the government to go collect information from Google, the courts already had hashed out this problem with respect to the Constitution because of bank records. So I think you're right that money is sort of the progenitor of a lot of these questions. It's the beginning of the conversation because it's the first thing that we kept records off of. Uh, and I think it's interesting that money might be the birth of a new decentralized system that doesn't rely on intermediaries. The, the first decentralized protocol is Bitcoin. Later we move on to things like DNS or certificate authorities or identity using blockchains and things like that. Um, as a tee-up, this is all a tee-up for you, <laughs> um, <laughs> do you have any cryptocurrencies? Do, do you uh, have any uh, digital money? Are you excited about uh, cryptocurrencies? Uh, so as a, as a privacy advocate, uh, I would recommend no one ever say uh, that they have <laughs> cryptocurrencies. But what I can say... That's very good. I like this audience. <laughs> <laughs> what I would say is this. Uh, when I was working uh, on the <laughs> sort of great project of my life back in, in 2013 uh, and trying to figure out things like how could I get uh, this archive of material to journalists? Uh, how could I persuade them that this is real, that this you know, is practical? How could they see things? in a safe way that's uncontrolled, that's unseen, that happens permissionlessly, uh, there's a question of, well, do I need server infrastructure of my own? Maybe the answer is yes. Okay, how do I pay for that anonymously? Maybe, maybe someone like me may have used Bitcoin for something like that. Uh, so I think there are a lot of technologies that we are here uh, <laughs> 
There are a lot of technologies that are, we are here for today uh, or that have served our interests in the past that have never gotten the kind of public shout outs uh, that maybe they could have. But when you create new human capabilities, people will use those. And yes, it is true, these things will absolutely be abused. But if we do not believe that people will use these new capabilities more often for good things than for bad things, we might as well pack up the game and say the human race is over, it's done, progress needs to stop, and we need to become less capable as people. Uh, we need to focus not on limiting what humans are able to do. Uh, we need to focus on creating better people, right? And the way we do that is by living good lives, living positive examples, by being good people, right, who touch other lives in positive ways and make them want to be creative, successful, you know, even self-sacrificing in, in certain contexts. Uh, when we talk about which cryptocurrencies are interesting to me, I've said before and I'll say again, Zcash for me is the most interesting right now because the privacy properties of it are truly unique. Uh, we see more and more uh, projects that are trying to emulate this and I think this is a positive thing. Uh, Monero's out there, I've used Monero, uh, just like everything else out there. Um, and this is, the idea here is you see these little tribal battles yeah. happening in the cryptocurrency space where, where they pick a, a flavor, you know, they pick a team and it's like a team sport uh, and whoever uses anything else is the enemy. And this is an enormous mistake because the entire uh, sort of population of cryptocurrencies, users, is a tiny minority of the human population. And that has to change if you want your rights to be uh, sort of asserted and defended when this gets to the democratic stage of regulation. Yeah. Uh, we need more teams. We need more projects. We need more users. I don't care what your particular allegiance or affiliation is. Uh, because we already see governments finally reaching the point where they're becoming very, very nervous and moving closer and closer to the point of muscular intervention in how these technologies can be used. And if we do not have broad uh, sort of public familiarity and use uh, that's willing to defend not just their coin, but everybody else's, <laughs> uh, we're going to run into real problems. Yeah, we had a speaker earlier today um, who referred to the maximalism that we see in cryptocurrency communities. Bitcoin will be the coin to rule them all. Ethereum will become the only global computer, things like that. They compare that maximalism to nationalism as a destructive force that is generally a net negative when it comes to human flourishing and the kind of making better people uh, objective that you were talking about earlier. Do you worry though about some cryptocurrency or related cryptocurrency projects. I mean, you, you mentioned that you may have paid for uh, server space using Bitcoin at one point, it, ideally because it was first, probably because it was a censorship resistant uh, payment. No one, Visa wouldn't, you know, process your transactions at that point, I imagine. Uh, your credit cards don't still work, do they? <laughs> well, this was actually sort of before uh, oh, I, I was known to the world. This so it was wasn't it during wasn't, the, the quiet period. Right. So it wasn't the censorship resistance then because you, you could have made the payment. It this was, was actually pseudonymity. Pseudonymity. Or, or anonymity. Privacy, problems. right. But if, if I was to ever find out your Bitcoin address, I could point straight to that transaction, which is kind of interesting. Uh, and Sure, back but then, the question is, how know, is the Bitcoin procured? Yep. And the Bitcoin was that procured in an honest way or an anonymous way. Right. So the only thing I'm driving at is the, the Bitcoin blockchain is actually extremely public. Um, devastatingly public from a, from a privacy and human rights standpoint. If you wanted to design a technology that would afford someone perfect visibility into the economy, you'd design Bitcoin and then try and get everyone Absolutely. to use it. Um, does that worry you? Um, are you worried about the emergence of, we talked earlier in the day about state-run cryptocurrency projects like the, the Petro in Venezuela? Um, do you worry about these tools yeah. being, being co-opted just as internet technologies have been co-opted by uh, dictators, by uh, powerful entities, corrupt entities? Uh, absolutely. It's not a question of if they will be, it's a question of when they will be. Uh, and it's a question of how do we design uh, competing systems uh, that are simply so attractive 
that they will not be ignored by uh, sort of the global consumer base, but also the governments themselves who are seeking to uh, uh, compete against them will not simply be able to outlaw them and have that be meaningful, right? Uh, and that's that's a tall order. But when you look at Bitcoin, right, like what are the central uh, benefits of Bitcoin? What are the central flaws of Bitcoin? Uh, everybody is, is focused on the transaction rate limitations of Bitcoins as being its central flaw. Uh, and that is a major one, right? Uh, but I would argue actually the much larger structural flaw, the long lasting flaw, is its public ledger. Uh, that is simply incompatible uh, with having a enduring uh, mechanism for trade because you, you cannot have uh, a lifelong history of everyone's purchases, uh, all of their interactions be available to everyone and have that work out well at scale. Uh, the limitations of how people engage with uh, these, these uh, cryptocurrencies are the, the limiting factor on the sort of apocalypses that we've had from it so far. Uh, and it's, I, I think, uh, a, a natural relief of pressure on it. Uh, but I don't think Bitcoin will last forever. And this is something that I, I think will be perhaps less popular with, with some people in the room. But, you know, we need to think about all of the technology projects uh, that we have seen in the past. Uh, the first browser created is not the best browser that we have ever seen. Uh, Bitcoin does important work, and I do think it will have enduring value for a long time. Uh, but particularly when we look at the core development team and their rate of improvement to the protocol, uh, they simply need to do better uh, or they will not be able to compete. Interesting. Um, so you have tweeted about Zcash and you mentioned it earlier. A uh, commonly um, repeated vulnerability or fear that people have with respect to Zcash is the fact that, well, it's somewhat twofold. It's that it uses rather novel cryptography, zero knowledge proofs, ZK snarks specifically, to obtain its level of privacy. So somewhat different than RSA or the gold standard encryption uh, that we see in other products. Um, and the second criticism is that it's a smaller group of developers that have worked on it, because almost by nature, there's only a small number of people in the world who understand zero knowledge proofs and understand blockchains the Venn diagram is small enough that the people who can build these two things into one is, 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 is centralized. It's, it's, it's a trusted intermediary in a way, but of course they're not actually there holding everyone's data like Google is. They have a different kind of power. They have the power of the pen with respect to a protocol that once given life might be fundamental infrastructure. They, in theory, uh, would be in positions to put back doors in although the software is open source, so maybe if enough eyes are on it, we're safe. Do you think that we're moving towards a world where those will be the new vulnerabilities, where um, people who architect systems are then almost like godlike um, because they lay down the rules and will never be able to catch up with their knowledge, and so they may always retain some secret power into the future, even once these systems are decentralized. Do you worry that we will lose touch with the ability to oversee and try and uh, democratically, if you will, move those rules to where we'd like to see them because it's this uh, intelligentsia class of coders who, who design them? Are those concerns of yours? And after you answer that question, um, <laughs> Do you think we're already there? Are our encryption standards already hopelessly yeah. backdoored? Um, maybe encryption standards that I think are actually not backdoored, um, certain elliptical curves and things like that, are they, are, what, are, what are the likelihoods on them not being backdoored at all? And encryption standards that Bitcoin and Zcash and other things actually rely on deeply. Yeah. Okay, so there were about 136 questions in, in there. <laughs> Uh, let me let me see if I can I can try to try to work so the, backwards. So the power of the elders uh, idea, right, right. The, the power of the elders, but first the the encryption part because I I think that's uh, the fundamental building block, right? We we have to have a table that we can we can put everything else on uh, in our discussion here, and we know encryption works. Um, encryption, like anything else, is you know vulnerable to advances in our understanding of mathematics. Uh, maybe suddenly we know how to factor numbers in, in a way that just simply was not possible before and nothing works, right? 
Uh, we don't see a road to that now, um, but maybe someday it happens. The thing that we have to deal with in reality, practically today, is we have to build based on what we know. And what we know is right now we can't uh, factor these numbers. These are reliable. And we have real world examples of that. I'm a great case, right? Uh, so we have this giant cache of top secret documents uh, that are held by multiple groups of journalists around the world. The New York Times, Der Spiegel, The Washington Post, The Intercept, uh, multiple groups of, of multiple institutions have this cache. Uh, and there are many documents in here that have never been published because as a condition of access to the journalists, I required them to agree to a couple conditions. Uh, the first and foremost of which was they would never publish any story simply because it was interesting or simply because it was newsworthy. Uh, they had to agree that they would only publish stories that they were willing to make an institutional judgment or in the public interest to know. Mm -hmm. They had to make the world better off. Um, but this would, of course, make it a target for, you know, the, the U.S. government to see what's in there, what sort of secrets they have that got loose that journalists know but didn't print. Other governments, right? Maybe the Russians want to break in. Maybe the Chinese want to break in. Maybe the Germans want to break in and see if anybody's spying on Merkel's other cell phone, right? Um, it's been five years since 2013, and it's never happened. Uh, we know this has never happened because... Even the NSA's number two official, uh, former deputy director, uh, Chris Inglis, said on camera, uh, it had happened. The NSA has the penetrations in all of these other governments and, of course, mass surveillance abilities to know. They would see indications that the people they're trying to spy on have changed their methods of communication. Uh, and it hasn't happened, right? Over five years with the world's most well-resourced attackers against a groups of sort of well-trained, but let's be honest here, still journalists. It's a bug bounty. If they can protect the world's best cache of secrets, right, for five years against the world's most motivated attackers, what does that mean for the average guy trying to protect his wallet? Pretty good thing. Yes. Uh, just to build on that. So uh, moving we on to that. We, we talk about, Sorry, in, go ahead. The, in the Bitcoin community, we talk about how there's a uh, multi-hundred million dollar uh, bug bounty now for elliptical <laughs> curve digital signature algorithm and for SHA-256 yeah. because if you can mess those up, you can potentially reassign balances to yourself. So right. There's some good you weight could, behind uh, these yeah, things. Yeah, you you made me feel a little better though. <laughs> <laughs> you could break private keys, you could forge transactions, you could do so many things. It's worth so much money now and nobody's doing it, right? Uh, the Satoshi blocks are still not moving around anywhere. Um, but, but the idea, when we go back into the, the larger scoping out a little bit about what does this mean for the world when we have this kind of technocratic elite, mm -hmm. uh, will they gain a power that uh, we can't compete with? Uh, the reality is we're already there. Yep. When we look at Facebook, uh, when we look at uh, Google, some of these people, like the head of Facebook, are already campaigning for the presidency in 2020. Uh, it's, it's quiet, but they're, they're laying the, the groundwork. He went to Iowa. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm, I'm sure it's a very exciting place for <laughs> Facebook. But uh, for, for those who aren't familiar with American presidential candidates, Iowa is the sort of very important swing state that they, they, they got to start campaigning. In. You go there, you talk about um, porn. But the, yeah, the, the idea here is when we have technology, uh, and our debates are based on people's knowledge, uh, and they have an advantage in terms of knowledge, uh, that's problematic. Uh, but it is not insurmountable, uh, because fortunately human intelligence is unevenly distributed, uh, and there are young, smart people in every corner of the earth at every level of the income bracket. Inequality is a serious and growing problem, right? Uh, but I would rather be fighting a battle of brains uh, than a battle of dollars. Right. So we only have a few minutes left. Uh, with the last bit of time, I just wanted to um, turn to a subject that comes up a lot, at least in the U.S. and the media, the, the fact that you're in Russia. Um, 
you could say, <laughs> look, <laughs> this guy says he's all about privacy and civil liberties and rights, and yet look where he's ended up. He's ended up in Moscow. He's ended up in many, place, in many ways in, in, the, in the heart of uh, totalitarian control. Uh, to Mordor. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> do you, do, do, how do you feel about being where you are? Yeah, I mean, look, this is something we hear again and again and again. And I'm, I'm glad you asked it because this is something that's on everybody's mind, right? Uh, the important thing to understand is that I didn't choose to be in Russia. Uh, as soon as the U.S. State Department stops ringing phones in Europe and, and threatening uh, chancellors, the minute they, uh, they seem like they might let me in, we'd be okay. Uh, I applied for asylum in 21 different countries around the world, right? That's not Russia. Uh, there were places like Ecuador uh, that said, okay, you know, you, you'll be able to come over. Uh, or at least it looked like they were leaning in that direction. And as soon as that happened, Vice President of the United States, Joe Biden calls the phone and starts threatening him uh, and says, if you do this, there will be consequences. Uh, we say Angela Merkel is, you know, happy with any kind of immigrant uh, in the world so long as they don't come from the U.S. intelligence community. Uh, and this is not to criticize anyone in particular. This is to comment on the nature of power, right? Uh, I am in exile. This is not a choice uh, of convenience. It's a question of if I go to prison for the rest of my life for what I believe was doing the right thing, right? It's not a question of what this means for me, right? I, I don't matter. It sucks for me. Let's, let's not have any doubts about that. But what does it say to the next whistleblower? What does it say to the next person sitting in the United States, in France, in Germany, wherever, when they know no matter how careful they are? And I was very careful, right? Uh, again, there are documents that have not been published. I could have put this stuff out on the internet myself, completely unredacted, I did not. Uh, I chose to make sure only things that would benefit the public came out. This has been the case for more than five years. The government has never shown a single case of anyone coming to harm as a result of these disclosures. And despite that, the only outcome is that that person goes to jail for the rest of their life. They don't even get to make their case to the jury uh, because it's forbidden in the United States to say why you did what you did if you're charged uh, for whistleblowing. Uh, and so it becomes a, a larger question of, well, where is the responsibility? Am I an American who does not speak Russian, right? I, I speak English. I am literally a former CIA agent uh, going to be able to reform Russia, which in case you haven't heard, has historically had a couple of problems in this area. Uh, or should I try to fix my own country first? Now, rationally, people would say, yeah, it should probably be the United States. I should try to fix. And that's what I spend the majority of my time on. But despite that, despite the precariousness of my position, despite the fact that the Russians could very easily force me out, even if it is unlawful to do so, uh, because I am legitimately protected, uh, because the charges against me are political under international law, um, I still criticize the Russian government routinely. I have cr criticized uh, the Russian president for violations of human rights, for passing new laws uh, that I consider to be repressive. Uh, they are repressive in Russia, they would be repressive anywhere. I do not believe that any government in any country uh, should be doing these kind of things. It's not up to them to decide who and how we can love one another. It, does not, it is not up to them to decide where the boundaries of human rights lie today and tomorrow. These are fundamentally public decisions, right? Uh, these are inherent decisions. Your rights are a part of your nature. They are natural. And I know to some lawyers, this is a little bit contentious here because they talk about natural rights and, you know, this is sort of diminishes the value of law because it says law can't regulate certain things. But I do believe there are certain things uh, that not just governments should not be able to do, but they do not have the right to do. Uh, and I'm not afraid to criticize Russia for that. I have not been so far, and I will in the future, no matter what the cost is. Uh, 
I don't ask you to trust me. I don't ask you to think I'm the most wonderful person in the world. In fact, I want your skepticism. Uh, doubt me, question me, criticize me, but for God's sake, question the people with the most power just as frequently as you question those like myself who have the least. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and hey, if, excuse me, for, for all of you who are there today, thank you, thank you so much uh, for, for listening. This has been really a pleasure to be a part of this. But if you are tired of me uh, being in Russia, by all means, please give the chancellor a call and ask, uh, I, I have one last ask question. when I'll be welcome. I have one last question to end on a, on a happy note. Um, could you possibly share an Ethereum address so we can send you some crypto kitties? Because <laughs> that would be awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Ed Snowden for coming and joining us. <laughs>